Howdy, folks. Um, Vern Paxson, the originator of Zeke and um, chief scientist at Corlite and a professor at UC Berkeley. And um, I'm going to be talking about a project I've been doing for uh, quite a few months on compiling Zeke scripts. Um, hopefully, I'll find the right sort of technical depth here. There's a lot of moving parts to this project. Um, if you happen to join in for my uh, talk yesterday, um, I was looking at uh, how to think about in high level terms, Zeke performance, and it's got essentially four parts that all have to go fast for the whole thing to be performant. Getting the packets, the, generating the events, interpreting scripts, and then the built-in functions those scripts call. And um, this key question that this work looks at is, can we make those scripts go faster? Um, given that they're interpreted. So um, in thinking about this, let's say that uh, if we're executing programs, either interpreting or compiling, we have some execution model. And it has uh, three elements. So you, you have to represent the program in some fashion. You need some uh, design for how the different values in uh, the uh data is represented. And then you need to um, execute against that representation of the, of the uh, program, which can include uh, the need to do recursion possibly. Um, so in Zeek and currently, uh, the way that programs are represented is trees of C++ uh, objects, and they look a lot like the original script, those trees, and I'll illustrate that in a minute. Um, the values are pointers to an, a basic class called val, and execution is done by recursively evaluating the nodes of the trees. So, for example, here's a simple program that takes two integers and computes some value, just a toy example, and that will turn into a tree that uh, captures the um, nature of the, of the program and will be evaluated first by assessing recursively this conditional, whether it's true, which will see whether do this multiplication, do the comparison, return the value, and et cetera. That program on the left there gets turned into this tree with 18 nodes. And, um, and then uh, that's the program representation. And then there is what is what are the values look like. And I mentioned their pointers to val objects. And that, that base class has six things in it. And in my point being, it's kind of heavyweight. Um, so there's a pointer to the values type. Uh, even though Zeek is, for the most part, strongly typed, um, types are also carried around at runtime. Uh, there is a union value that holds the actual value. I'll be talking about that later. And then uh, the val is derived from Zeke's basic object class. So it's got a reference count, it's got a location for error messages, and it's got a Boolean and of course a virtual type. Another part of the design is global variables have their values associated with their the identifier and locals live on an interpreter frame. All right, so here is the low level representation of values. Um, the uh, union type is got all these different things in it. And one thing we note is that for most of these, they're represented in, in, in low level things, not vowels themselves. And so they don't have um, reference counted memory management. And that's gonna be something that we're going to need to address. Now the last part, we've got the program representation is this tree of nodes and those and, and how values are represented. And now we need to think about executing. Um, so the execution proceeds recursively, as I mentioned, and um, the uh, arguments to the function will be bound to those local variables. And then each element in the tree is assessed. So for this particular program, um, there will be a uh, in, in the asterisk up here is because it's a little bit, a little bit more nuanced than what I'm framing here. I'm doing this simplified version, but there will be 12 
C++ calls, which may be inline for speed, but um, still not, not um, some of them certainly are not. Um, 16 memory management increments and decrements for the reference counting and four um, val objects that are created and destructed. So that's quite a bit of work to do that function. So then let's talk about um, a different execution model. So if we want to change the representation of the program for more efficient um, execution, we can think about, well, we could turn it into C++ and then separately compile that, for example, or we could compile it to an abstract machine, a sort of uh, assembly language like low level representation that is interpreted, but um, uh, potentially a lot more efficiently because it's quite low level. Um, and the decision I made on this is at least for now to compile to an abstract machine. And the reason is that the uh, tool chain then used for um, uh, users to have their scripts get compiled is, is simple. It's all inside a single Zeek execution, does not require separate um, compiling and dynamic linking of scripts. Um, I do try to leave enough abstractions to that, uh, switching that to be compiled to C++ is not a huge amount of work, but it's certainly not a small amount of work. This abstract machine is called XAM. Um, uh, and just stands for Zeek Abstract Machine. Now, that's the program representation, and we need uh, to design values. And uh, the BroVal union is not appropriate for uh, low level um, uh, execution because it, it, it's in some ways it's too low level, namely the fact that it doesn't use reference counting for aggregates means that you cannot easily share those aggregates in multiple places, even though that is Zeek script semantics are that aggregates are uh, essentially shallow copy. So um, XAMVAL union is a lot like BroVal union, but it, it has um, hooks for this and I'll illustrate that in a bit. And then the execution is gonna be a, uh, a loop with a switch in it um, and a low level interpreter. So um, I'll show that in a sec. And then calling functions will be done um, using C++ calls, uh, including recursion. All right, so what do we need to do to get all this? Um, so first, we need to take an existing abstract syntax tree, those that would, uh, the interpreter's representation, and reduce it. And re reducing it means simplifying it, essentially, and introducing temporary variables. Um, the result of this step is still a Zeek script, so it's still executable by the interpreter. Um, but every expression in it is either just a variable, just a constant, or just one operation on one to three of variables and constants. And if the expression is, uh, its operands are all constants, it is folded to just be the, the result. So at, at compile time, we compute the, uh, value. Um, so the, the goal with uh, this, this reduction is now the representation is closer to what we're going to try to compile to. And it's also easier to analyze for optimizations. And I'll talk about those in a minute. So here is the original script in the right. And on the left is the reduced form. You can see these uh, uh, temporary variables that get introduced with their funky names to make sure they don't collide with actual um, original script variables. So here we computed into this temporary that value there. And then we do a comparison against it. And the comparison is of a simpler form, et cetera. And so, um, so far we've just kind of bloated up the script. And indeed, these reduced forms will run a little slower than the original often. But we can think about optimizing them. And um, a key uh, tool for doing this is what's called use defs, which is uh, tracking where definitions, namely assignments to variables, are used. And when you do that, and if you do that um, uh, exhaustively and correctly, um, then you can start optimizing. And in particular, you can do 
the following sorts of stuff where you can propagate constants. So you can tell that some variable is assigned to a constant and then later the variables used, you can just drop the constant in there instead. Uh, you can figure out when two different uh, variables really are just aliases when one's assigned to the other. And so you just don't need that second assignment, use the original instead. Um, and you can find variables, values that are not actually used. And so don't bother computing them. And then a biggie is common sub-expression elimination, which means you figure out, hey, I already computed this value. I'm not going to compute it again. I'll just use the original. Um, doing all of this correctly requires that these use steps are accurate. If they're not, um, disaster. <laughs> you get optimization bugs. And then there's another which um, I haven't done so far, which is uh, hoisting loop invariants out of loops. That would be a, another sort of classical optimization at this point. Uh, one sec, there's a comment in chat. Uh, I don't understand that comment. Okay. The um, Sorry, I need check out timing here. No, nope, we're good. Um, OK, so the optimizer, for example, will on this program realize that, hey, we already computed A times A up here. So let's just use that local in place of this uh, computing this temporary and not bother with the temporary. All right, um, so we are used this general strategy, which is anytime you can statically determine something at compile time, do it um, and avoid runtime uh, testing that um, like, hey, should I compute this as a double or should I compute as an integer or whatever, you instead factor that out at uh, compile time. And the fact that uh, Zeek uses strong typing really helps here. So this is much harder in a language like, you know, say Python where um, it takes a lot of work to be confident you know what type something is in some context. And in, in Zeek, generally, we know it. In fact, one of the big headaches here was the any type, which is um, where we don't have strong typing. The um, abstract machine is, is represented as a bunch of XAM instructions, which are called Zints. I'll illustrate those in a minute. It's got a program counter, which is an index into this array of Zints. What, what, what are we currently executing? Uh, each instruction has an opcode, just like an assembly language, and it's got a bunch of parameters. I'm going to show all this in a minute. And then execution just goes until you run off the end of the program uh, or an error happens. And so here's what that looks like. We start the program counter at the beginning, and here's that loop, which is, hey, are we still inside the program? Uh, and no error. And if so, then get the current instruction right here and then switch on its opcode and do whatever work is associated with the opcode, bump the program counter. Down here, if there's a branch, it will instead assign the program counter to where to branch to, and it'll execute a continue so that we just hop to the beginning of this loop. Let me walk through this instruction format a bit. Um, so, uh, and this is a little simplified what I'm showing, but, but most of the stuff that's the, the most salient stuff is all here. So there's a, an opcode, the thing we switched on. There's up to four integers. And the uh, usual design is generally, but not always, the first of these integers, v1, is the target of evaluating expression. So we're going to assign into a, the uh, frame, which is a bunch of XAM val unions, uh, a vector of them. Um, will assign into the V1 element of that array. Uh, and often the other integers here are other uh, frame slots, but they, they might be offsets or, or so forth. It depends on the instruction. Um, the instruction knows what type is associated with, um, uh, generally with any constant in the um, uh, in the instruction. Um, and the instruction knows whether or not memory management, namely reference counting, is appropriate. Going a bit fast here, because there's quite a bit still to cover. Um, so if we take this program on the right, which was the uh, reduced form, 
uh, with the optimization, um, it gets compiled into this XAM code on the left. And something to keep in mind is, in, you know, we've got some sort of frame layout. And a part I'm not going to have time to talk about is um, reducing the size of this frame. So that that's, turns out to be an important optimization. All right, so the first instruction here says, let's load a value and that means load it from the interpreter frame. So this is the bridging between where values are managed in the interpreter and in XAM code. And let me walk through how that instruction is specified. So the, the key here is wind, we wind up with hundreds and hundreds of opcodes um, and we don't wanna write them all as um, just a bunch of C++. So instead we have a um, quasi declarative templating language where we just say, okay, I, I want uh, an, a, a, an instruction called load val. That's, you can see the name up here along with this extra VV we'll talk about in a sec. And here I'm gonna define how it works. So in particular, we start off saying, this is an internal operation and we'll see one uh, in the second example, I'll go through that is uh, instead tied to interpreter information. Um, and it's gonna use V1 and V2. And that's, that's why this name has VV in it. And the way to, uh, what, what to do when this instruction is executing is the following C++ code. And it's going to, um, take the interpreter frame, grab the element specified by um, the V2 slot and uh, uh, stick it in the V1 slot. So the for every instruction, the current instructions um, always in, for its execution is always in a variable called Z. So we use Z.V2 to get that. And this build val is going to build up a XAM val union given a uh, uh, interpreter val pointer and in the type of it. And we need to pass in the type even though the val has its own type to deal with the headache of dynamic typing and type any. Um, assign v1 is then going to take that value and assign it to the frame XAM frame element given by the v1 slot. And both of those are just macros. So this is actually turns into very little um, code to, to execute. All right, I'm gonna illustrate one more of these and then I'm not gonna have time to go beyond that. Um, sec, uh, hold on. Okay. Um, so here we wanna compute uh, A times A and stick it into zero. So we're getting um, A off of the uh, XAM value um, frame and multiplying it and sticking it into another slot in the frame. This instruction has a template that looks like the following. And I, I wanna show this because it illustrates um, some of the power of the templating, namely a whole lot of work can be done very, with very simple um, templating instructions. So first off, that says to the templater, uh, I want a uh, expression operator, namely a thing that ties to an interpreter expression and it's binary. So it's gonna have two arguments and its name is times. So now um, the templater is going to automatically glue together any times expression in the interpreter tree to generating this instruction. This line says, I want three flavors of it. One that's for integers, one that's for counts or unsigned and when that's for doubles. And by the way, I want it vectorized too because all of that is supported by, by uh, Zeek and scripting. And the way you evaluate it is you just multiply in C++ star operator. So you multiply the first and second operands and then assign it into the V1 frame. So this will spit out all these different XAM instructions um, and then the compilation process will just pick the right one uh, for any given instance of that expression, of the multiply expression. Okay, um, I'm gonna switch gears now to talking about um, the representation of um, 
the Zambel Union representation. So this is the um, interpreter's representation. It is a little out of date, um, just because when I made the slide, things things had changed, uh, have changed since. Um, and the Zambel Union keeps some of these things directly, but all the ones in gray change somewhat. And in particular, they tend to change to not use the low level representation like row or string, but instead use the vowel representation. And the reason for that is so that they can be uh, use reference counting for memory management. In addition, down here, Zam record, Zam vector, these ch fundamentally change the representations of records and vectors to be C++ vectors of Zamval unions. For record, um, it's a fixed size and for a vector it can grow and shrink. Um, and they also point to uh, record val and vector val, the, the current interpreter ones, um, to enable both representations to manipulate the same underlying values. This change also gives some speed ups to the event engine. Um, that are completely optional. Namely, then you don't have to touch the event engine, everything will work more or less, um, but it can go faster. So let me illustrate that. In the event engine, um, this is what is executed every time there's a TCP event, for example. Um, and this code will do this lookup of these fields. So this is updating the connection record by name, and then does all these uh, assignments which may um, create new values or reuse existing ones pending. And in um, with the Zamval unions, this can instead uh, look like the following. We directly fetch the record values and we don't create any vowels at all. We just directly assign using the set field, uh, which returns a reference to the um, Zandal union associated with the record offset. So uh, much more efficient, no um, dynamic creation, no lookup by uh, strings. Okay, um, now another question here is, well, how do we make the uh, uh, function calls cheaper? How can we do that? And well, the number one rule is don't make them. And what does that mean? Well, it means you inline instead of um, making calls. And this, we're gonna hoist the functions code into the caller's body. And um, now all we gotta do is assign variables for the um, uh, parameters to the functions and to the return value. And um, we can do this everywhere other than when something's recursive. And it turns out that's very rare in the uh, Zeek uh, main, the script code base, there's only like five functions out of hundreds that are recursive. Um, and so because Zeek processes the entire script base all in one shot, um, other than for, for plugins, um, this can be done globally and very aggressively. Um, I'm gonna go quickly through this example because uh, we're getting low on time, but here was our original function. And now I've added, hey, Zeke init is going to print it out with two arguments. So that's going to turn into this new uh, inline expression, which um, tracks uh, the hoist the body into the Zeke init event. Um, something you don't see in that original function call, but in fact, uh, it's doing coercions um, of these constants um, due to the um, type mismatch between integers and unsigned. And so um, that's a bunch of work that the compiler can do statically. Um, it's then going to transform that into this, this is still script, but it's hard to tell, into this new catch return statement. It's going to renumber all the variable, rename all the variables to avoid any collisions. And finally, it can do this because, because it knows the values of A and B, it can immediately compute statically the value of the return value, which is going to be 28, it turns out. And 
now none of that's needed because we know the value is 28. And so the final XAM code for that is simply print out 28. So the, all the work of the function call has been um, subsumed. Okay. Status. This is available in my branch. Um, there's also a new branch that is just the, the XAMVAL union sort of changes, um, which we hope to get into master fairly soon. Uh, it's a lot of code um, and uh, still needs review um, and, and needs to be migrated to master. Um, I also need volunteers, people willing to run it, check it for correctness and whether it improves performance and how much. Um, as Robin mentioned earlier, we're targeting it to include it in Zeek 4.0. And uh, finally, how much faster is it? I'm going to skip this so we can go to um, Slack. But um, the bottom line is for pure scripts, it's a lot faster, three to 10 times. But um, you know, for actual operational Zeek, it, it depends a great deal on just what you're doing, how much scripting, um, how many events, et cetera. So I'll stop there and we can go briefly to Slack. Um, a reminder that there is info about that at the um, uh, YouTube um, invite. See you there.